staying right with God. One of the unique features of the Adventist message is the conviction that the end time judgment begins before the end. Now, most of our Christian friends believe that the final judgment occurs at the second coming of Jesus. Or in sort of a twist on that, that people are judged at the moment they die and then they you know, go up or down at that point. Now, if you go to heaven when you die, or the other place, you really don't need a judgment at the end, do you? So Adventist teaching is sort of a seamless whole. It is a unity where everything fits together. And one aspect of this is recognizing that the dead know not anything, and that in the end the resurrection will occur at the second coming. 1 Corinthians 15 seems pretty clear on that. Then uh, if the dead rise at the second coming, then the judgment needs to precede that time so that people can go in the proper directions when Jesus comes. And for whatever reason, Adventists are kind of unique in this understanding. And one of the reasons, one of the concerns that some of our Christian friends have is that the New Testament doesn't really seem to say that. We've come to our pre-Advent judgment idea by calculating from the book of Daniel and so forth. And so many Christians say, well, no, where's the gospel here? Uh, some Old Testament teaching and so on. So I want to take a look tonight in the book of Revelation and ask the question, does Revelation teach that the final judgment takes place before the end? Now, we learned last night that you had two earlier phases of judgment. And uh, there we agree with many of our Christian friends that judgment is not simply an end time thing. Judgment occurs at the cross. Judgment occurs whenever the gospel is preached. But the end time judgment, the final judgment, does that begin before the end is the question. Judgment is about staying right with God. Remind you of the three phases of judgment that uh, we saw in the New Testament last night. Phase number one, judgment at the cross. The entire human race is judged in the person of Jesus Christ. And two things are determined, remember? Number one, that the human race is totally incapable of earning the favor of God. Or to put it bluntly like I did last night, human race stinks. All right? We are mired in sin, we are hopeless, helpless, etc. But the second thing we learn at the cross is that in Jesus Christ, in his perfect righteousness, in his obedience to the covenant, he has earned for us acceptance with God. So the entire human race is judged negatively in its sin, but positively in the righteousness of Christ at the cross. Then phase two, the preaching of the gospel, whenever that gospel is presented, whenever what happened at the cross is presented, people can't stay neutral. They either receive that message totally, say yes to God's acceptance of them, say yes also to his diagnosis of our condition. And when both of those occur, then people receive Jesus Christ. They have eternal life. Present judgment is positive. When people reject the gospel message or simply neglect it. Do you remember Felix, the governor? He didn't reject the gospel message. He just said, this is interesting. I'd like to hear about it again sometime. And sometime never came. You see, whenever the gospel is preached, there's no middle ground. Felix was not in the middle ground. To not say yes is to be less likely to ever receive it in the future. So whenever the gospel is preached, judgment takes place. And then we learned last night that there's a third phase of judgment judgment that occurs at the end. And that judgment ratifies the decisions that the human race makes in phase number two. And I highlight there a couple of texts that are of interest. John 12, now is the judgment of the world when Jesus is lifted up. John 3, whenever light comes into the world, some people prefer darkness to light, and so they step away from the light. Someone asked me last night and said, how much do you have to confess? 
I mean, how far do you have to go? And you know, I really wasn't that clear last night, so let me, let me try to do it tonight. And basically what I said was, look, the light is what brings out the truth about you. The question is simply, are you willing to come into the light? If you come into the light, you will, need to know, you will know all about yourself that you need to know. Will God instantly reveal to you all of your sinfulness? No. It would kill you. That's what happens when you walk into the presence of God, His glory is there, you see everything there is to say about yourself it would kill you instantly. No. But when you come to Him and you say, Lord, take me as I am, Help me to know the truth about myself. God will give you as much truth as you can handle. And then if you walk in the light, your sinfulness will grow clearer and clearer to you over time. And as I mentioned last night, the process of authenticity is a lifelong experience. I'm reminded of a statement of Ellen White, The Steps to Christ, one of my favorite statements. The closer we come to Jesus the more clearly we see the defects in everybody else's character. <laughs> you know that statement, huh? All right. That's great. You see, I deliberately misquoted it just to test you. Now I think you can understand that statement. The closer you come to Jesus, the more you are in the light, the more you see the truth about yourself. But Jesus only gives you as much light as you can handle. John 16, 12, I have many things to tell you, but you can't handle them now, says Jesus. But when the spirit of truth comes, he will guide you gradually into all truth. John 16, 12 and 13. So when you come to Jesus, it isn't a contest to figure out how depraved you can become. No, it's simply to say, Lord, I am willing to be exposed. I am willing to know the truth about myself and I'm willing to lay it on the altar and receive the acceptance that you have. And God will unpack to you over time as needed. And sure has done that with me, I'll tell you. If I had time, I could tell you many stages in my life when I thought I was real, really real, and then God ambushed me. I'll tell you just one. When I started out in ministry, first year of ministry, Sabbath headaches. Any of you have Sabbath headaches? Mine started at about 10 in the morning and lasted until about 3 in the afternoon, and then they went away. This is beginning in ministry. I thought I was being real, but you know what God revealed to me eventually? He said, you are trying to be Billy Graham. You are trying to be Mark Finley. You are trying to be Doug Batcher. You're trying to be HMS Richards. You're trying to be the perfect pastor for these people. All I'm asking you to be is John Pauline. For me. That's all I'm asking you. And when I realized that ministry was not about some ideal that was out there, but ministry was being who you are for Jesus Christ, the headaches went away for me. You see, that headache was God's signal to me, not necessarily to, to whoever raised their hands, but to me, that headache was God's signal. I wasn't being real. And therefore, I needed to take another step with him. I won't bore you with a whole lot of other steps I've had to take, but you can read about those in the book if you want. Anyway, so God takes us through these phases, reaching out. And finally at the end, Acts 17.31 God has appointed a day when he will judge the world, says Paul in Athens. So we have these three phases of judgment in the New Testament. Now let's come to the book of Revelation, because the same three phases are in the book of Revelation. But here's the interesting thing. The language of judgment, unlike the Gospel of John, unlike Paul, the language of judgment is reserved in Revelation only for number three. The book of Revelation never uses the language of judgment for phases 1 and 2. Let me show you what I mean. Revelation 5, 9 to 12. Is Revelation 5 a judgment scene? Yes and no. The language of judgment isn't there. Uh, the, uh, the language of Day of Atonement isn't there. The language of Most Holy Place isn't there. And so in Revelation 5, 
is not the end time judgment of the world, but what is it a judgment of? A judgment of the Lamb. Who is worthy? Who is worthy is the question. And the answer is the Lamb that was slain. So the judgment of Revelation 5 is the judgment of Jesus Christ. Has he accomplished the salvation that he set out to do? And the overwhelming answer of Revelation 5 is yes. The judgment that occurred at the cross is sufficient. It has set the table for everything God wants to do in salvation. So phase number one, judgment at the cross, is exhibited clearly in Revelation 5. But what's going on with those horses in Revelation 6? If you dig into the Old Testament, you discover these four horsemen of Revelation 6 are based on a number of texts in the Old Testament. Leviticus 26, Deuteronomy 32, Zechariah 1 and 6, just some examples. And what these texts are in the Old Testament are the curses of the covenant. The curses of the covenant. What are the curses of the covenant? Talks in the Old Testament about blessings and curses. You know what they are? If you've ever done a business contract, you know about blessings and curses. Because blessings and curses are the consequences of carrying out the contract or not. I'll give you an example. The bridge went out in Berrien Springs. One day we had a bridge. The next day some government guy ran over the bridge and he said, it's about to collapse, I think. And they closed the bridge. Permanently. In an instant. Well, somebody came up with a scheme, let's build a new bridge next to the old one so we don't have to waste time tearing the bridge down. They figured if they did that, they could probably build a new bridge for in nine months. Now you see what happened is, without that bridge, the only way to cross the river was 15 kilometers north or 15 kilometers south. And you don't think of a river as a barrier until you want to get a car across it without a bridge. And then it's a barrier. Well, the entire downtown of Berrien Springs died almost overnight because nobody was going in the shop anymore. Nobody had, you know, I mean, you had to go into town. It was like a dead-end street. You see, so nobody was passing through anymore, and so all that business was gone. The town was desperate. And so they made a contract with the builders of the bridge. And they said to the builders, all right, we expect this bridge to be done on May 26. All right, and this contract was signed. They agreed to it. And they said, every day before May 26 that the bridge opens, we will add $10,000 to, your, to the payment for the bridge, a $6 million bridge or something. We will add $10,000 for every day you finish early, and for every day late, we'll take $10,000 out of what we're going to pay you. That's blessings and curses. You know what? They finished the bridge on May 1. <laughs> Motivating stuff. <laughs> blessings and curses, you see. The four horsemen are all about the blessings and curses of the covenant. You see? If you do not receive Jesus Christ, terrible things happen. There's division. There's famine for the word of God. There's spiritual pestilence and disease that comes in. So the four horsemen are all about the consequences of the covenant. It's about the preaching of the gospel. The white horse goes out to present the gospel. And then those who reject they suffer the consequences of greater and greater misery. So Revelation 6 is about judgment number 2. Although the word judgment doesn't occur there, the concept is there. So judgment at the end, many places in the book of Revelation. I list one just as an example. Revelation 19, verses 17 through 21. Judgment at the end. So in the book of Revelation... All three phases of judgment are found, but only the third phase uses the language of judgment. The words for judgment only occur in phase three in the book of Revelation. Maybe 20 times in Revelation, one of the judgment words in Greek, but they only apply to the end time. So Revelation, I believe, clearly places the final judgment before the end. I think in the book of Revelation you can demonstrate that the Adventist belief that there's a pre-Advent judgment is not just an Old Testament doctrine, it's a New Testament doctrine. How am I going to do that? Take a look at this text. 
Revelation 14, 7. He said in a loud voice, Fear God and give him glory, because the hour of his judgment has come. Worship him who made the heavens, the earth, the sea, and the springs of water. I pulled this over from one of my classes, so you'll forgive the Greek word, but maybe there's three or four people here that recognize that Greek word, and if so, you'll understand what I'm saying. Because it says here, fear God and give him glory. Why? Because the hour of his judgment has come. Now in the Greek, that word elthen is a, uh, what's known as an aorist tense. Now, you don't have to remember all that kind of stuff, but the aorist indicative is a past tense in the Greek. So the construction that we have here is definitely prior to this announcement. What is this announcement in Revelation 14, 7? It is the last proclamation of the gospel to the whole world, the everlasting gospel to every nation, kindred, tongue, and people. What is true at the moment that the last proclamation of the gospel goes out? The hour of God's judgment has already come. It's a past tense. So here in Revelation 14, whatever this means, God's judgment has already begun when the final proclamation of the gospel goes out. Therefore, the final judgment precedes the end of the world. But what kind of judgment is this? You know, as uh, some critics of Adventism have said, well, it's judgment number one at the cross. That judgment has already occurred. Is that what Revelation 14, 7 is about? Is it investigative judgment? Is it executive judgment? What kind of judgment is this? Revelation 18 will clarify it for us, but we'll begin with Revelation 6, 9, and 10. You see, there's only one place in the first half of the book of Revelation where the word judgment occurs. Only one. And that's right in this text. When he opened the fifth seal, I saw under the altar the souls of those who had been slain because of the word of God and the testimony they had maintained. They called out in a loud voice, How long, sovereign Lord, holy and true, until you judge the inhabitants of the earth and avenge our blood? So there's a whole bunch of martyrs here who have suffered persecution, and they're crying out to God and say, How long... What? Has judgment started? No. The complaint is that judgment has not started. The only time the word judgment occurs in the first half of the book of Revelation, it's to say judgment hasn't begun yet. So in Revelation 6, the final judgment has not started. In the Greek, it's actually saying, how long will you be not judging and not avenging. And these are present tenses. In other words, how long, Lord, are you not going to judge? So judgment has not yet begun in Revelation 6, 9, and 10. But keep an eye on those words. How long until you judge and avenge our blood? That's what the martyrs are asking. Take a look at Revelation 19, 1 and 2. After this I heard what sounded like the roar of a great multitude in heaven shouting, Hallelujah! Salvation and glory and power belong to our God, for true and just are His judgments. He has condemned the great prostitute who corrupted the earth by her adulteries. He has avenged on her the blood of His servants. These are the same exact words in the Greek as Revelation 6. Revelation 6, how long will you be not judging, not avenging? Revelation 19, he has condemned, judged, has avenged. And once again, this is that aorist indicative we talked about a little bit earlier. The judgment here has already happened. The prostitute has been judged and has been avenged. That is what he is saying here. So compare the two. See the comparison here? How long until you judge and avenge? And here it says, he has 
judged. He has avenged. Can you see that? There's clearly a shift here. In Revelation 6, judgment has not begun. In Revelation 19, it's begun already. It's finished, actually. So let's chart this out here. Revelation 6, 10. There's an appeal. How long, O Lord, do you not? Revelation 19, instead of an appeal, there's a celebration. How long will you not judge? Now it's a celebration. You have judged. Here's a call. There the call is carried out. Will you not judge? You have judged. He's not judging in Revelation 6. He has judged in Revelation 19. He's not avenging in Revelation 6. Has avenged in Revelation 19. I want you to see that contrast. It's very, very important. In the book of Revelation, there's a movement from what's going on in chapter 6 to what's going on in chapter 19. In other words, the end time judgment, the final judgment of earth's history occurs sometime between the fifth seal of Revelation 6 and Revelation 19. And before you go home tonight, you're going to know exactly where it is in the book of Revelation. Just a timeline here to illustrate it in another way. In Revelation 6, there's a time of not judging and not avenging. Revelation 19, the judging and the avenging is past. So somewhere in between, the judging and avenging take place. That's what we want to discover in the book of Revelation. Here we have uh, illustrations of four different chapters in the book. So I don't know, maybe some of you don't quite think the way I do, but I sort of, when I think of Bible books, I think of each chapter sort of as a rectangle like this. And so you have 22 chapters in Revelation, would be like a whole row of them. And then the contents of each of them, uh, you could run down there if you wanted to. Well, here's chapter 14, 17, 18, and 19. And if you remember, in Revelation 19, verse 2, it was saying that judgment is finished. Vengeance is finished. It's all done. All right? When was that done? What is Revelation 19, 2 referring to? Well, first of all, it's referring to chapter 18, because in chapter 18, you have the city of Babylon being judged and being avenged in that chapter. It also goes back to chapter 17, because in chapter 17, Babylon the prostitute is destroyed by fire in verse 16. So chapters 17 and chapters 18 focus on the destruction of Babylon, the judgment, the execution of Babylon. Revelation 19, 2 summarizes what was taking place in those two chapters. But it goes even further back, and in Revelation 14, and verse 8, it says, in anticipation, Babylon is fallen, is fallen. Remember that text? So Revelation 19, 2 is a summary of the activity against Babylon that occurs in chapter 14 first, and then in chapters 17 and 18, Babylon is destroyed. Revelation 19, 2 celebrates it. Chapters 17 and 18 in particular describe it. So that end time judgment occurs in chapter 17 and 18. The question is exactly where and how is all this taking place? Let's take a look a little bit closer. Before we do, just two issues just to remind you. Number one, is the judgment of Revelation 14, 7 investigative, executive, something else? We still don't know for sure. The word occurs there, but the context isn't clear on exactly what kind of judgment it is. And second, is the final judgment at the Advent or is it before, as Adventists teach? We can clarify these issues in just a moment. Let's go to Revelation 18, right in the middle of the final judgment. Revelation 18, 4, you all know this text. I heard another voice from heaven saying, Come out of her, my people, that ye be not partakers of her sins, 
and that ye receive not of her plagues. For her sins have reached unto heaven, and God hath remembered her iniquities. What does that sound like? What does that text sound like? Come out of her, for her sins have reached unto heaven. God hath remembered her iniquities. First of all, the call to Babylon is pre-execution. The call to come out. It's pre-execution. Babylon has not been destroyed at this moment. The call has come out of her so that you don't end up destroyed with her. Can you see that? All right. So this verse, at this point in time, Babylon's execution has not yet occurred. So we have a call, to, the last call to people to come out that they might not receive. But notice what else. There's an appeal to forsake Babylon. Come out of her, my people. Before the execution, God appeals to people to come out. Why? Because of these reasons. Give back to her as she has given. Pay her back double for what she has done. Mix her a double portion from her own cup. Give her as much torture and grief as the glory and luxury she gave herself. In her heart she boasts, I sit as a queen, I am not a widow, and I will never mourn. It strikes me that this type of language is a very particular kind of language. It's called court language. It is an indictment of her actions. You familiar with that idea of indictment? It's a listing of the charges. It's a summing up of what Babylon has been convicted for. Here we see the problem. Babylon has persecuted the saints. Babylon has you know, poured out the blood of the saints. She has boasted. She has tortured. She has made people grieve and so forth. It's a judicial sentence. Now what's the point in a court trial of a judicial sentence? Where are you at that point? The sentence occurs after the investigation, after the judgment, but before what? The execution. Now execution doesn't have to mean death penalty, but execution can mean putting someone in prison, requiring them to do public service, whatever it is. In other words, the consequences of the judgment are the execution. But the sentence comes when the judgment is finished, the investigation is finished, everything leading up to there, here's the conclusion, and now the person goes out either to be set free or to be executed and so forth. So this sounds like a judicial sentence. Give to her according to what she has given. Pay her double for what she has done. Mix a double portion for her own cup. Give her as much torture and grief as the glory and luxury she gave herself. So the sentence on Babylon is that she is to be treated according to how she treated others. Actually, this seems to be based on the book of Deuteronomy, known as the Law of the Malicious Witness. Have you heard about this one? It's an interesting one. Let's read it. If a malicious witness takes the stand to accuse a man of a crime, the two men involved in the dispute must stand in the presence of the Lord before the priests and the judges who are in office at the time. The judges must make a thorough investigation, and if the witness proves to be a liar, giving false testimony against his brother, then do to him as he intended to do to his brother. You must purge the evil from among you. Now that's an interesting twist, isn't it? If you can demonstrate that witnesses in the court trial are lying, then they end up with the sentence that they had hoped would happen to the accused person. It's a biblical approach. What happens in the book of Revelation here is based on this law. You see, what Babylon has been doing through the years is accusing people of not being true to God. Accusing people of, uh, of working against God. And they have often gotten the state to punish those people, even though they have been faithful to God. And God says he is counting up 
the actions of the malicious witness and one day she will receive according to what she did to others. Verse 8, and this is the crucial one. Therefore, in one day, her plagues will overtake her. Death, mourning, and famine. She will be consumed by fire, for mighty is the Lord God who judges her. I want you to look carefully at this verse. First of all, you notice here, in one day her plagues will overtake her. Is that present, past, or future? That's future. She will be consumed by fire. That's future. Future tenses. In other words, at the point of Revelation 18, 4 through 8, execution is still future. She has not yet been destroyed. She has not yet received the penalty of her sins. The execution is yet ahead of her. The avenging is still ahead. But notice this. Mighty is the Lord God who judges her. That's not the most helpful translation because once again we're dealing with an aorist here. Remember I mentioned that word earlier. Aorist is a particular type of Greek past tense. And in this case, aorist participle means that it is something that happens before something else. What is the something else? Her destruction. What happens before the something else? God judges her. So the judgment comes before the vengeance. The judgment has already taken place at the time of the sentence. So what is the judgment all about? Investigation and analysis and judgment. That is what this word is all about. In other words, in the book of Revelation, before the final events of earth's history, before the destruction of Babylon, God's judgment has been in action and draws to a conclusion at the time when Babylon is destroyed. The book of Revelation, I believe, is extremely clear, and that is the investigative side of the judgment precedes the end. It is pre-advent. Revelation does not give us a date. It doesn't say 1844 or any other time. But it does tell us that judgment comes before the end, and it does so clearly. At the point when judgment is already passed, Revelation 18, 4 to 8, the execution is still future. Here's my translation, Revelation 18, 8. The God who has judged her is strong to execute what he has judged. That's the message of Revelation 18, 8. So Revelation 18 highlights two aspects of judgment. First of all, there's the verdict, the sentence. Secondly, there's the execution. But the verdict already assumes a process of judgment that has taken place and has drawn to a conclusion. So the book of Revelation teaches clearly what Adventists have believed, and that is that judgment precedes the end. As we mentioned last night, the judgment of the living takes place just at the end. As the final proclamation of the gospel goes forth, so in heaven God is ratifying the decisions that people are making on this earth. Coming back to the law of the malicious witness, I want you to notice that how does God go about this? When somebody is giving malicious witness, what does God do? He says, you make a thorough investigation. You see, we talked earlier about the fact that God opens the books. God doesn't just, he doesn't bring Justice Hollywood style. What is Justice Hollywood style? It's some maverick, you know, who's, who sees the evil and, and all the government is blind to it and he goes and shoots everybody up and then everybody's happy. You know, society is restored. Well, occasionally you get lucky that way. But far more often, justice is established by careful investigation, careful analysis, sound judgment. That's how societies find justice. And God's government is that type of open system where God does not just arbitrarily move in, but God allows a thorough investigation. He probably has...
uh, angels, solicitor angels, you know, that are out there doing their job and bringing the evidence together so that the whole universe can understand that God is just and true and righteous. Once more, the timeline of judgment in, in Revelation. But notice here, this motion. There's a time when there's no judging and avenging, but then comes the judging with a verdict, the execution, and then in Revelation 19, the celebration. The time is past. Judgment has not occurred in Revelation 6, the time of the fifth seal. So my suggestion there for those of you that like to study the history in these things, the fifth seal occurs before the beginning of the final judgment, before 1844 or any other such time. But then, as we draw to the closing events of earth's history, God completes the investigation, completes the judgment, and moves to the execution. The bottom line is, is judgment good news or is it bad news? For those who are in Christ, it is good news. Because judgment is not only negative, judgment is also positive. In Matthew 10, 20, 10 42, it says, if someone so much as brings a cup of cold water to a child, it will be remembered in the judgment. What's that all about? That is simply a recognition that the judgment means that everything you and I do matters. It doesn't matter how small that may be. The housewife, you know, sweeping the floor, feeding the baby at three in the morning, and all those little activities, you can get into that rut and you feel like nothing you do matters. And Jesus says, if you even give a cup of cold water to the child, it will be remembered in the judgment. Everything you do will be remembered. Everything you do matters. For those who are in Christ, the judgment is a positive thing. You know, I'll never forget, and I'll close with this, I'll never forget a scholarly meeting. And these were secular scholars. And these secular scholars sort of... Um, you know, they don't, they don't always take the Bible quite in the way that you and I would. They're not so serious about Bible prophecy and all these kinds of things. And uh, they're into things like feminism and uh, other isms, you know, new types of ideologies of reading the Bible and so forth. And uh, I remember this one day, they were discussing Paul and his view of judgment. And I'll never forget, there was this one fellow here, crusty old, he looked like a Nazi general, you know. He was smoking a pipe, and uh, he was articulating the idea that Paul believed in resurrection and judgment. You see, and a lot of people were trying to say, oh, there is no resurrection, there is no judgment and stuff, and Paul wouldn't be stupid enough to believe in such things. So, you know, these were added later. You know, you may not be aware that some scholars do that kind of stuff, but it happens. And I remember this fellow, he was standing against the grain. He was saying, no, I believe that Paul believed in judgment and Paul believed in resurrection. And the amazing thing is, they turned on him. And they accused him, pardon me, but they accused him of neo-fundamentalist crap. Right there, in a crowd. And he became angry. And he said words that I will never forget. He said a few other words that I won't repeat. <laughs> but these words I will never forget. He says, folk, if there is no resurrection and there is no judgment, there will never be any justice in this world. If there is no resurrection and there is no judgment, there will never be any justice in this world. You see, for the Jew, judgment was never bad news. Judgment was the day that the Jew could sue for heavy damages and win. You see, judgment was the day when the wrongs of this life would be righted. Judgment day was the day when the wicked and the abusers and the Gentiles and the foreigners and everybody that had made life miserable would receive what they justly deserved and God's faithful people would receive what they justly deserved. You see, the biblical concept of judgment 
was never intended as bad news. And it's a sad misunderstanding if it feels like bad news. Judgment is there to show who have made their lives right with Christ and to give them their proper place in God's eternity. So I invite you tonight, as you have received Jesus Christ, as you have accepted what is done on the cross, to walk in confidence before the judgment and to know that if you're right with God today and you continue in being right with God, you stay right with God. You have absolutely nothing to fear for the judgment. Would you stand with me? And let's give ourselves once more, rededicate ourselves to the God of judgment. Lord, I thank you for this message. A message that tells us that the judgment is not some horrid thing that strikes without warning when we least expect it, but that it's a careful procedure a long-lasting procedure, one in which the books are open, in which nothing is unfair. Everything is done in proper order. Lord, give us a confidence as we approach that judgment that if you've given us the assurance of your presence now, it will not be taken away then. That if we know Jesus now and we walk with Jesus now, you're not going to take it away suddenly. No one can take us out of your hand said Jesus. So we thank you tonight for the message of judgment as well and pray that you would help us day by day to have a clearer and clearer picture of you so that we may share it with neighbors, friends, relatives and be that church of the remnant that you would have us be for Jesus' sake. Amen.